It is a pleasure to welcome you today and give some brief introduction and a very special welcome to our Roosevelt University president, Ali Malekzadeh, uh, who is with us this afternoon. We are so pleased that you've joined us today for a very important discussion on criminal justice reform. Recent events have proven that we urgently need to reimagine public safety in order to serve and protect all Americans. And we've been asking ourselves and each other, what does true justice for all look like and how do we get there? We are honored to have Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin and Defense Attorney Jared Adams joining us today to discuss their work to address inequities in the justice system. We're looking forward to hearing their thoughts on community policing, accountability, and cr crucial system-wide reform. Before I share more about our guests, I wanna make sure that our audience is aware that we do have dedicated time at the end of the webinar for questions. So we encourage you to use the Q&A feature throughout the hour to ask your questions and we will address as many as we can in our time together. Now on to the introduction. Mayor Richard Irvin, who was born and raised in the city he now leads, made history when he was elected mayor of Aurora, Illinois in 2017. He is the first African-American to hold the position in Aurora's 180 year history. With the new themes of there's something happening here, and Aurora is open for business. He has spearheaded new levels of energy in the city. An attorney by profession, Mayor Irvin is a former assistant state's attorney for the Cook County State's Attorney's Office and former prosecutor for Kane County State's Attorney's Office, where he also served as program founder and community-based prosecutor for the successful Weed and Seed program in Aurora. And he is also a Robert Morris University alum. Jared Adams is an attorney who specializes in criminal defense and civil rights cases, practicing in both state and federal courts. Adams was wrongfully convicted of sexual assault at age 17 and sentenced to 28 years in a maximum security prison. After serving nearly 10 years and filing multiple appeals, Jared was exonerated with the assistance of the Wisconsin Innocence Project. He used the injustice he endured as inspiration to become an advocate for the underserved and often uncounted. Jared is a Roosevelt alum completing his bachelor's in criminal justice in 2012. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Natasha Robinson. Natasha is a professor at Roosevelt University. She teaches courses relating to criminal justice and is a faculty member of the Government, Law, and Justice Department. Professor Robinson has been a licensed criminal defense attorney for 20 years, having served for 12 and a half years as an assistant public defender of Cook County, specializing in the representa representation of indigent clients charged with felony crimes. Please join me in welcoming our panel today. And Natasha, I'll turn the mic over to you to start our discussion. Thank you so much, Maybelline, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you to Roosevelt, uh, the community, to our president, uh, President Malexide. Uh, we are just so, so, so thankful and happy for you all to be here, and especially to our esteemed panel, uh, Mayor Irving and Attorney Adams. And so uh, even though it feels very official right now, we're going to kind of, you know, relax and have a conversation. Absolutely. And the conversation is just going to be uh, the beginning of many, hopefully, that will sprout uh, from conversation to action. All right. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, we're going to get into our questions and just by way of uh, protocol. If you have questions, and this is for the audience, if you have questions, please put your questions in the chat so that we can come back to them and answer them as we will make sure every question has been answered. All right, so uh, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you all some, some questions that will start the conversation uh, as a collective, and then there may be some questions which you may want to address individually. All right? Absolutely. So the first question is to get us started. 
could you share a little bit about your background and what led to your current careers? Brother Adam? Go right ahead, brother. Oh, you want me to go? Okay. Yeah, I, go, go right ahead. Go right ahead, brother. It's an honor to you. But, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to speak and, and also to be on, on you know, this panel with the mayor. Um, I've, I followed, you know, your run. And so from afar, I was proud and am even prouder now at the history that you've made out in the city of Aurora. So I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge you for that. Thank you, brother. Um, you know, look, my, my story isn't one I would have signed up for. Mother, uh, pretty much a single mother, south side of Chicago. I don't have the story of, of, of being in the streets and turning my life around. I'm, I'm fascinated by those stories. I grew up in communities um, with people who have those stories, but I pretty much stayed out the way as a child. And, you know, that's even more scary because it seems like um, despite me not having a record and, and getting into any trouble, that's not how I was treated when I got in face in, in the face of the judicial system. And so having gone through that, I took a detailed, you know, diary, so to speak, about the inequities and the un injustices that took place along my journey through the criminal justice system. And in, in going through what I went through, I, I don't have a story of an act of violence that I saw that is my biggest memory of going to prison. My biggest memory that is still etched in my memory today are the wrinkles and creases of anguish that line my mother's forehead as she blamed herself for not being able to afford to get me an attorney. So it was that after getting my conviction reversed and meeting a lot of other gentlemen who were the victims of, 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 of not, not what they've done, but in a lot of times, the victim of the circumstances of their upbringing, their communities, their lack of resources. So when I got out, I didn't simply want there to be a period where God only intended a comma to be. It wasn't supposed to be Jared Adams wrongfully convicted, the end. It was supposed to be what I'm working on right now, which is trying to find a way to, to make sure that my testimony is shared to inspire others to do the same. It's not gonna be one case that fixes this thing. It's not gonna be one mayor. It is gonna be everyone that is, that is living in the United States right now to try to work together to set aside our differences, to make this place a place in which we wanna leave it for our descendants and loved ones. And so in doing that, I had to go to school. I knew I wasn't gonna be able to get this done without educating myself. I had the experience, but I had to go to school. I chose Roosevelt because I loved the history of Roosevelt. I loved how it was founded and how African-Americans found Roosevelt as a, as a school of refuge that would, would accept them. I loved that embodiment. So I enrolled in Roosevelt and I worked full time as an investigator at the Federal Public Defender's Office while going to school at Roosevelt. My office was about two or three blocks away from Roosevelt, and my office was 55 East Monroe. So I was able to get to work 5.30 in the morning, do my homework, go out in the field, serve subpoenas, look for witnesses, get off of work at 5.30, do my homework, and make it to class at 6.30, and get out of Roosevelt 9.30. I did this my entire time because that is just how, how important it was for me to get to where I am today. Having gone through that, graduating through law school, I am mentioning all of these accomplishments not to impress anyone, but to impress upon folks who are here the importance of grabbing hold of your dream and never ever letting go. And that's why I'm here today and that's my background story. Wow, great story, brother, great story. You, you know, and I've, I've got you know, somewhat similar, similar story to you and come at starting off and, you know, just took a little bit different path as, you know, during, um, just, just throughout my lifetime. I also, I was raised in low income housing in the city of Aurora, Aurora Housing Authority, a single mother that raised my brother and I, you know, we had um, different fathers. His father was in and out of prison. My father um, was on drugs and, uh, you know, just growing up in that environment, you know, you deal with whatever young, young men deal with in that environment, you know, gangs and, and drugs. And as I was coming up, that's when gangs started happening, kicked off real strong in the city of Aurora. And, you know, because of the neighborhood I lived in, you know, I 
was in a gang just because everybody else in my neighborhood was in a gang. Right. You know, wore the colors, wore the hats tilted to the side, you know, because I thought it was cool. You know, until when I turned uh, 15 years old and a friend of mine that I grew up with from the time we were five years old, you know, and, and, and when you grow up in a neighborhood like that, it seems like everybody's your family. You know, when he shot and killed a boy, you know, and went to prison, you know, as an adult. And uh, from that point on, it just, it woke me up. And I realized just being involved in, in, in gangs, there was nothing good to come of it at all. So at that point, I just, I, I pretty much divorced myself from the community that I grew up in. And, you know, I, I wasn't very good in high school. Matter of fact, my average grade was a C minus. I remember having to, to uh, beg my Spanish teacher for a D instead of an F just so I can graduate with my classmates. And uh, he gave me a, a, you know, a D uh, minus, which evidently was enough for me to graduate. And you know, after I, I graduated high school, I remember asking my mom, who at the time worked at a factory, which is most of the folks in my family did. I was the first one in my family to graduate from my media family to graduate from high school. I said, Ma, what next? And she said, well, get a job. That's what we do. And I said, you know, I, I felt like I didn't know what it was I wanted to do and the direction I wanted to follow. But I, I knew that I felt that there should be something more. Not that, you know, getting a job in a factory was a bad thing. That's how she, you know, took care of, of me and my brother, you know, but uh, that's how my grandfather, you know, took care of our whole family, who was the, uh, the male figure in my life. But I, I just felt like I should do something more. So I joined the military. I joined the army uh, and spent most of my time in Germany. But while I was in the army, I got, uh, I got deployed to the Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War. And while being there in this, you know, almost third world country, seeing people with the same color of skin as I had, struggling, living in, in huts, no bigger than, you know, large, you know, refrigerator boxes. You know, I thought to myself, I want to do something to make sure this inequity and unfairness didn't happen. I don't want to do it here because this is not where I'm from. But the, what I see here and what I see in my community growing up in low income miles, and I just want to work to do whatever I need to do to make sure to, to create fairness and, and equity create an equal playing field for folks. Didn't know how I was going to do it, but that's, that was my goal. I said, if I make it back alive from the, from war, and there were a circumstance where I didn't think I was going to make it back alive. I said, if I make it back alive, I'm going to commit my life to doing better and doing more. So I, I got back, I got out of the military. I used my GI Bill and college fund, which was the whole reason I went to the military to, you know, to afford to go to college one day. And I found Robert Morris college later to become Robert Morris university. And while there, I, I, uh, I, uh, I, realized that I was a lot smarter than I was told my whole life. You know, I was a lot, you know, if I committed myself and, and just paid attention and, 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 and forced myself to do more that, you know, I could excel. You know, I went to Robert Morris and, and I, I remember the first test I ever took it was an African-American woman. Her name was Miss Sim. She was my communications teacher. I got a B plus on it. She said to me, you know, Richard, you know, I think you are a very smart, intelligent young man, which I had never, people have never told me. Now they said, because I talked a lot, I should be a lawyer. But it was when, when people said that it, it was almost like a fairy tale, like you should be an astronaut or something like that. Right. You know, so I never took it seriously. But you know, Richard, oh, you made good points, you should be a lawyer, because I'd be arguing with adults, my grandma and folks. But anyway, this, 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 uh, this teacher, this professor says, you know, you got a B plus, that's good. But I think you can get an A. So on your next test, I want you to study a little harder. I want you to work a little harder. You know, I want you to focus a little more. And I want you to get an A. So I got an A on that next test because she asked me to and she believed in me. And then uh, it felt good. So I got an A on the test, that, the next test and the next test. And I got straight A's all throughout my, my associate program. And I, I began to believe in myself because somebody believed in me. Uh, and you know, at that point, I, I, I decided I wanted to go on and get a four-year degree. Robert Morris University started you know, uh, uh, a four-year program. I stayed there. I left for a little while, I came back came back with the idea that I'm going to be a lawyer. Now, everybody looked at me like I was crazy because nobody had graduated from the four-year program yet. And I was already talking about not only graduating from the four-year program, but going on to higher education. So I was the first person in Robert Morris history to go on to higher education uh, after a bachelor's program. So similar to you, I'd come to Robert Morris during the day. At night, I'd go study for the bar, uh, Barbary, uh, the LSAT, to, uh, to prepare to take this test to eventually become a lawyer. So I'd go to school during the day, uh, LSAT, uh, LSAT prep during the night, and on the weekends, I'd work a part-time job. You know, so I was constantly focused on, on being better. 
So it came to the point where I, I took the LSAT. I used, took my LSAT with my GPA and, uh, you know, my military background applied to only three law schools, Northern Illinois University, Southern Illinois University, and U of I, because those are the only three state schools that had law schools. And I had to go to a state school to get the GI Bill and college fund. So uh, I got accepted to Northern. I went to Northern, passed all my three years and uh, passed the bar exam on the first try, which, you know, oftentimes you hear folks don't do, especially background where I came from, uh, became a prosecutor in Cook County, worked there for about a year and decided, you know, it was like being in the military. There was a, you know, a thousand prosecutors spread out, you know, and I didn't really know everybody or know anybody that wasn't where I was from. So I went to a smaller county, uh, Kane County, which was the Aurora, which was uh, where my city was, worked my way up uh, within two years, became a felony prosecutor. And I won't lie to you, it was difficult for me when I first became a prosecutor because every day in court, I would see someone that I, that, that I grew up with. I would yeah. prosecute someone or their children that I grew up with. Every single day I'd see someone, it was hard and I was gonna quit. This wasn't, it, it didn't feel right. But uh, a, a white man told me, a white defense attorney says, if you don't stay here and ensure equity, ensure fairness and you because your background and and where you're from and and you knowing these folks and their background and where they're from you're the only one that'll understand the circumstances and be able to treat them fairly so i stayed um, and did four years as a prosecutor my second two years i was the first ever community-based prosecutor working out in the neighborhoods that i grew up in in aurora you know i mean stopping crime from prostitution in our in our neighborhoods from drug dealing to you know all the way up, up up to murder prosecuting and just getting out in the community and helping people understand that this is where we live this is our home let's take back our community we don't have to accept that people are standing on the on our streets selling drugs we don't have to accept that there's prostitutes let's let's be proud of our community doesn't matter if you live in low income housing or government assisted housing the fact is we live here let's take pride in it and after, uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I started my own law firm a block down the street from where I grew up in low-income low housing, the same, exact same street. I used to play there as a kid in this parking lot. You know, uh, and, and after doing that for a number of years as a defense attorney, now defending the folks that I, that I grew up with and you know, folks that look like me and talk like me, uh, yeah, I, I decided I wanted to run for office. And I became an alderman at large. I was an alderman for 10 years and now I'm the first black mayor in the city of Aurora for in 180 years. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't an easy track, but it was one that's, that, that was worth working, working for. And I, and I, as you do, I don't tell this story, you know, just for me to hear it, you know, and, and to pump my own self. I tell it to let other young people that look like me, that grew up in the same neighborhoods as me, that I'm no different, I'm no better, I'm no smarter. I just had, I, someone believed in me, I began to believe in myself. And I want to impress upon people that if you believe in yourself and, and, and work hard, you can get to where I am. If I did it, so can you. Simple as that. And, uh, you know, now I've been mayor three and a half years, coming up on reelection soon. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to just do the best I can to uh, make my city the best city in Illinois. My goodness, there is so much to <laughs> unpack in the sharing of your stories, both from you, uh, Attorney Adams and Mayor Irving. Um, there are some commonalities that I hear. Uh, some threads that you shared included the fact that there was a, a intentionality of the community to support you. Uh, somebody speaking into your lives and saying, despite what others may box you in, you have the ability to go above and beyond that. Uh, Jared, with you uh, in your pursuits of your undergraduate and your law degrees and Mayor Irving, uh, with you in terms of uh, going overseas to fight for our country and then come back and then the career that happened from there. So I, I guess my question is, how were you able to, with, with all of the background that you have, and this is a question for both of you, for all of the background that you have, for all of the challenges that you have, what is it that helped drive your ability to come back and get your undergraduate and your graduate degrees as adults? Uh, because we have a significant population of students at Roosevelt who are adult learners. So how did you structure your schedules and your experiences to align in order to be able to accomplish what you have described? 
Yeah. Yeah, I'll start this one. Um, yeah. After I got out of the military, the, the whole reason I went to the military was one of the reasons the most important was to get money to be able to go to college. And I knew that I should go to college. I didn't know why no one in my family had, had gone to college and could give me the, tell me the experience, but you know, about the experience, but I, I knew that if I wanted to be more and do more, be more than my circumstances, be more than this, just this little nappy head boy that grew up in, in Aurora housing authority. I, I knew I needed to be educated. You know, I was already educated somewhat when I went in the military and traveled the world to Germany, Saudi Arabia, Greece, different places, but I, I wanted to be, you know, academically educated so I could compete on the same level. Cause I recognize, you know, and, and as we all know, as, as African American men, we got to work longer and harder, you know, than our, than our counterparts, you know, that don't have the same pigmentation in, in our skin. So I, I knew to get ahead that I, I needed education. And once these folks started to believe in me in academia, and I began to believe in myself, I figured sky's the limits. There's nothing I can't do. So I just started setting long-term and short-term goals and reaching those short-term goals all the way on my way to my long-term goal was eventually to hold public office. And here I am. I used to say I, I used to say I wanted to be the first black president of the United States, but I got beat out a little bit. So I decided, that, you know, I'll just go ahead and settle for the first black mayor of the, of the city of Aurora. So uh, Nothing wrong with being the second. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being the second. You're absolutely right. <laughs> now, more than <laughs> now more than ever. <laughs> Attorney uh, Adams. So, I, I mean, similar, similar to what the mayor did. Um, so when I get home, 10 years had passed. I went in when I was 17. I didn't come home until I was 26, turning 27 years old. And I was very angry. I was very upset. And so what my mother did, she encouraged me to go and, and seek therapy, you know, because I needed to find a way, just like a lot of young African-American males in impoverished areas across the country, I needed to learn how to channel my anger and frustration into the fuel that would drive me to hitting my goals. And that was a way for me to be able to do it. So what I did was when I first got a month after getting out, I sat down and I wrote out a plan. And at the end of that plan was being a lawyer. So to analogize it and to make it, you know, easier for me to digest and keep going, I imagine being a lawyer at the top of a mountain. But when you look at the top, it's pretty daunting. So I decided to look at the middle first, right? So once I made it to the middle and look back at the top, it was that much more closer. Exactly. The middle for me was getting done and getting into Roosevelt, the LSAT, and all of that. When the mayor mentioned LSAT and Barbary, I, my skin just started to <laughs> Didn't it? That's Didn't that wasn't nothing nice. <laughs> like, man, that's how much I do not miss that part. So, exactly right. Flashbacks. Um, Flashbacks. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, um, you know, I saw it. I kept writing it down. And also, for me, my motivation was right in front of me. When I was incarcerated unjustly, that 10 years wasn't just taken from me. I went from cookouts and fish fries to coming home. I'm taking people to dialysis treatment. I'm visiting aunts and uncles in, in, in old folks' homes. So I felt like I was on a clock to get this degree to show them that the 10 years that they put in me and invested in me was not for nothing. So I'll say this to the population of folks that are on here now that is almost at 100. Here's what I'll say. I want you to look straightforward and see your goal, whatever that is, on the side of a barrier, on the opposite side. And this isn't just a goal. You can't live without this thing, okay? So if that's the case, you are going to find a way around, over, under, or right through those barriers to get to what you cannot live without. And that's exactly how I treated where I wanted to be. I got through, passed, uh, I graduated from South Suburban College, um, went into Roosevelt, graduated from there, but it wasn't over. I still had it to make my way through law school. I received the Chicago Bar Foundation Scholarship. I wrote out the application for the Bar Scholarship downtown in Roosevelt, don't you know how like you could look right across at the water and all of that type of stuff? Mm -hmm. I, I, I picked the most serene spot that would put me in the best position to be as calm as possible and to focus on what it was that I was trying to do. I applied for the Chicago Bar Foundation Scholarship. I received the scholarship. I went to Loyola. I did the three years all while working. And so what I'm telling you is that the brain 
And the psychology is no different than any other muscle. You have to work it out in order for it to become stronger. So I kept working my brain out to seeing what it was that I wanted so that I wasn't going to ever let it go. And I decided that my, if my turnout um, didn't match my turn up, I was going to be tuned out. Mm. So that's why I decided to focus. And you know what? I was right. The clubs ain't going away. They just got better. Now I can afford to go to them. So <laughs> that, that's really how I set my mindset and going to hit my goals. Okay. Man, let me, let me just follow. Let me follow because that's exactly that's exactly what I did. I didn't look at it as the mountain. I would set these long term goals, the mm -hmm. mayor, and every day I'd I'd look at that. I'm gonna be the mayor of Aurora one day. I'm gonna be the, and I told myself that every single day, all the while making short term goals, getting closer to that to that end goal. So I, I mean, exactly that's exactly the way you got to look at it if you want to achieve anything. You just got to set that long term goal and and just keep chipping away at it, but always believe that you can get there. And the, and the more you chip at it, the closer it gets, you're there and you're like, hey, <laughs> here I am. Yeah, so, so you both raise important points about the determining of the goals and then deciding not just the destination, but the, uh, not just that destination outcome, but the way to get there, the methodology. Exactly. And so I'm sure I'm, I'm going in a huge presumption of thinking that your goal setting was not in a vacuum because there is still a reality in which you live, move, and you function. So mm -hmm. my next question is, as it relates to what you do now, uh, before I get into the specifics of what you do now, can we frame the discussion to talk about what does social justice look like and mean for you? If you had to define social justice, what does that look like? What does it feel like? I know uh, Attorney Adams, you know that in Roosevelt's uh, mission and vision statement, it is specifically attuned to social justice. Mm -hmm. So how would you define it? Or how would you, how do you know it when you see it or when you don't see it? Yeah, um, I mean, to me, social justice, true social justice is colorless and valueless. And what I mean by that is, um, everyone should be treated equally. Um, and, and I know it's difficult to, to, to do that in terms of criminal justice uh, because every case is different. But in terms of, of the treatment of individuals, it shouldn't be defined by color and by pocketbook or by religion. And that's true, in my opinion, social justice is equality. Okay. Thank you so much, Mayor Irving. You know, I agree. Social justice is an equal playing field where everybody has the same opportunity, you know, as others, whether it be uh, to be lawyers like me and Brother Adams or whether it's being treated fairly as defendants when you walk into a courtroom, regardless of the color of your skin, your economics, what neighborhood you grew up, grew up in, everybody gets the same opportunity, equal playing field. Now, does it exist? I, I, absolutely not. And, and it may not exist for years, all as long as folks like us keep working toward it. That's all I can say. You know, maybe one day we'll reach that goal in our in our lifetimes. But uh, you know, as we see happening around the country right now, you know, our, our our brothers and sisters with the same color skin, our African Americans are not treated the same. You know, as that that uh, white defense attorney told me all those years ago, you know, close to 20 years ago, that if I didn't stay here at the state's attorney's office and ensure, you know, equal fairness. Uh, you know, an equal treatment to those that came through those doors that look like me, that they would never get it from, yeah. you know, my white counterparts. Um, so I did as much as I could while I was there. But, you know, there are very few black prosecutors, you know, they're more so black uh, defense, uh, public defenders, but even not, even not as much as there should be, given yeah. the numbers yeah. of, of the, you know, um, you know, the black folks that walk through the doors of the courthouses. But if when that day comes where there's an equal playing field, everybody's treated equally and fairly, regardless of the circumstance, that'll be social justice. And, and, is it, it, and if I can if chime in on what, what the mayor said, listen, I, sure. it had to be difficult to be, you know, a prosecutor and watch so many people rotate in and out like that, 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 look, that looks like us. Because essentially, you, you, you can help, but the help is, is more like spooning water out of the ocean, right? Yes, yes, yes. It's, yes, systematic, yes. it's a systematic problem. And so I want people to understand that, that when, when we're having a conversation about equality um, and why, why it has to be re equal representation, it's because 
we all have unconscious biases, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a judge who looks like me uh, and, and, and Mayor Irvin could say, you know what? I can see how this kid went down the wrong track, hanging with the wrong group of friends, but I'm not gonna give him uh, uh, 50 years in prison and, 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 and effectively blow out his candle before it even has the opportunity to be lit. And I'll give you another example. Um, there was a Stanford swimmer case a few years ago where, where a guy, a kid was guilty of sexually assaulting a student who was passed out on the side of, of the college campus garbage can. The judge in that case gave this kid um, um, time in a county jail and his exact words were, he doesn't look like a kid that can survive in, in, in incarceration. So for a judge to be able to say something like that, you have to understand that he meant every word that he said. And, and that if we don't have equality, I, I bet you can look and find that he's never said that to an African-American kid, right? right? And so those are the things that we're talking about and why there has to be equal representation and equal voices, and not just in the courtroom, but in the legislation that finds its way being litigated in the courtrooms that becomes precedence. So the day that that judge can look at look at a black kid and say that same thing to a young black kid that you don't look like you'd be able to survive in the prison system. Therefore, I'm going to give you time serving probation. On that day, we can we can say there's equal justice, exactly. and you know, but that day is not here. And I don't yeah. think if the, if the, if it was flipped, that kid that judge would not have said the same thing to a young black man. And the, and the thing is, is that the equality. If I could weigh in, uh, the equality goes even further back to the judge because at this point if the judge is saying anything then that means that either there has been a plea of guilty or a finding of guilty so to go all the way back to maybe on the street where it's that police officer who is that gatekeeper to be able to decide you know what i have a relationship or an investment in this person let me see how i can you know try and navigate the stoppage if you will of him coming into the system and then if the police officer can't do it then like Mayor Irvin, you were a prosecutor, you know you have an, a, a, a lot of discretion, if you will, to be able to decide not only who to charge, but you know, but what to charge and what to recommend. And then Attorney Adams, you have the discretion as the attorney to be able to say, okay, well, while a client may be able to decide whether or not to go uh, to trial or, or, or things of that nature, you have the ability to be able to construct their defense in such a way as you are their uh, vocal uh, presentation, if you will. Um, so it's just so much to discretion. There is a question that is in the chat that talks about discretion. It is from uh, Vanessa De Real. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, this question is for the mayor. As a prosecutor, how were you able to ensure fairness, fairness in quotes, in the cases that you prosecuted? Were you able to use your own discretion to either dismiss cases or offer defendants diversion programs instead of jail? Or, Perhaps. okay, okay th this is a long question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or were you stuck prosecuting as many cases as possible because that is what your supervisors would expect? Well, I would tell you this, my supervisors did expect that we had a, uh, um, that we prosecute as many cases as possible, and we tried as many cases you know as possible and got guilty convictions. However, um, we did have discretion, and I used it often. Matter of fact, I remember times where you know a police would maybe violate somebody's constitutional rights, uh, and I would see it and say, "Look, I'm not even going to bother taking this case to hearing, you know, because we would lose because you clearly violated that that guy's constitutional right. Why even? Why even? Why should I even argue that?" You know, and there were times where I won't lie, I prosecuted people that I know. And I said, look, man, I we grew up in the same neighborhood. We used to play together, you know, as, as teenagers. We used to spend night over each other's house. I, you know, I know your people. So maybe I'm not going to give you 10 years in prison. Maybe I'll give you probation and drug because you got a drug problem, you know, some type of drug counseling. And there were times when we had we had a diversion or what we called a second chance program where I tried to put as many young people, especially many young black people in these second chance programs as possible. I remember when I left the, the state's attorney's office um, and I became a defense attorney. And that very first week, I represented a young, young African-American man, young black kid. He's only a kid. He's 19 years old, but, you know, old enough where he can go to prison for a whole a long time based on his age, not based on his mentality and, you know, based right. on knowing what's right and wrong because he's still a kid. But. 
you know, eight, you know, back then 17 years was, was the age where you can go to, you know, go to prison, depending on the crime you committed and even younger, you know, if it, if it was a class X felony. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kid committed residential burglary, which we all as lawyers know requires you, you know, to go to prison. Um, and uh, he just broke into some house and was stealing some video games from his friend. And these, these prosecutors wanted this guy, this kid to go to prison. I remember I cried, you know, having to deal with that case, looking at this young boy and seeing that his life, that he had ruined his life because he's a stupid young kid, you know, and these prosecutors weren't willing to allow him. Prosecutors that I had worked with for years weren't willing to allow, to give this kid a break. And, you know, and I just thought back to, man, if I was there, I would definitely have given this kid, given this kid a a break. And these are the stories that we hear all the time. You know, our young people out there just doing stupid things. And I, I got a son that's 18 years old and I, I worry about him as well, you know, that he could do something stupid and end up in a circumstance where, you know, he's in front of somebody that won't treat him with social equality. Yeah. I, and for the audience, the three of us know, uh, before residential burglary in the state of Illinois, that is a class one felony which carries a possible sentence of four to 15 years in prison, unless you may qualify for a, um, a drug treatment uh, program, task like right task, which mm-hmm. means now you have to admit that you have a drug problem, which may have other consequences, not just in the courtroom, but outside of the courtroom as well. Uh, so that is one of the, the perspectives that Mayor Irvin is referring to. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and it's, it's- it's not, it's, it's okay, we, the criminal justice system is one thing, but then there's this. It seems that after it gets a hold of you, it never lets you go. Mm. That's not what you're talking about, right? And so, it, it, and, and if you think about that, you're disenfranchising folks, mm-hmm. right? You know, mm-hmm. explain to me how uh, committing any felony should take away your fundamental rights of being an American, which is what? Voting. The voting, yeah. So, if, 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 if that's the punishment, then that's likened to putting people on a boat and shipping them out, out of America because they don't have the fundamental right to vote who's in office. So there are things that have been slid in from years and years ago, and it's just taken so much to unearth them because they're having a disproportionate effect against the folks who are closest to the problem, but furthest away from the resources to implement the solutions. So then my question, as we move into criminal justice and criminal justice reform, Attorney Adams, can you talk about your, uh, I would argue, a dual perspective Mm -hmm. of having gone through the criminal justice system falsely accused and now being a uh, participant within it as a criminal defense and uh, civil rights attorney? Can you talk about those two perspectives? Yeah. I mean, it's so... Because I went through it, I know the totality and, and, and impact that it has on a family, right? So within my practice, I make it a part of my practice to take that time to explain to the family about what's going on. Because in my opinion, the family is the, the innocent victim in, in this thing, right? Whether a person did commit a crime or, or not, um, it's his family who's all going to take that trip with the phone calls, with the visits, with raising, you know, kids or folks who are incarcerated. It's the family when a person is is released on parole or probation or or, or conviction overturned who has to deal with making sure that that person gets back on their feet. It's the family in these communities who don't have the resources to provide reintegration skills. I am a unicorn. I'm not supposed to be where I am at all because of how the system is designed and set up, which is a reason why I am am so strong to advocate about the impact that it's having because I get it. I get it from that side, from this side. And and, and if people who are football fans, I'll say this, my experience with being in there, litigating to get my way out and now litigating to get other folks out, I can see the field like Patrick Mahomes. Mm. That's how clear I can see it. I would have mm-hmm. said Mitchell Trubisky, but that's another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sensitive subject. So, uh, if you I know, could... let me let me just let me just follow up on that. You know, I say that all the time, and I, I'm not supposed I, I'm not supposed to be here. If you look at my background and how I came up, my family, it it it, it 
it appears that I'm not supposed to be in this position, but I am. And mm -hmm. since I am, it's my responsibility to reach back and help out as many young folks as I can, you know, through that same door I walk through. So that, that, that's my goal, to reach back and give people a hand up. Indeed. So, uh, Mayor Irving, in talking about uh, your uh, commitment to social justice and reaching back and, and helping uh, others, um, you have a program which I you know, won't get into the details because uh, I promised I would not, uh, <laughs> but we have uh, a program that you started in Aurora called the Change Reform Initiative. Yes. And Change is an acronym for Community Helping Aurora's necess no, Necessary yes. Growth and growth Empowerment. And empower. mm -hmm. All right. And All right. so um, this program that you have initiated is, is in four different stages. What specifically necessitated uh, your decision as mayor to propose a review of uh, existing practices within your city as well as an overhaul in some respects of how things have been and how they need to become. Well, you know, with what happened with George Floyd in, in Minneapolis and the ripple effect, you know, around this country, Aurora was not left out of that. You know, um, a uh, week before we had um, introduced this change initiative, which is something that, you know, we had to make a decision and come up on pretty quickly. A week before that, we had riots right here in the city of Aurora. You know, I've been mayor three and a half years and I've worked hard to do economic development and rebuild our city. You know, our, we're an old city, 180 years old, you know, so we got some old bones and old infrastructure, you know, old buildings that have been sitting empty, empty, many of them for, you know, 70, 60, 70 years, you know, and my job was to redevelop this. And we've been doing that. We turning some of these old buildings into, you know, new, constru uh, new construction uh, apartments, and, uh, you know, just whatever we can, new business, new businesses. And I saw with the riots um, from what was happening around the country, destroy our downtown, you know, in a matter of minutes, what it took us years to build, you know. And as I, I, I sat there in the police situation room, which is our, our EOC, Emergency Operations Center, and I saw as the drones went overhead as, you know, things on fire, police cars on fire, my, you know, my downtown just on fire and people running around destroying things. You know, I, I was conflicted. In one sense, I'm the mayor and I'm saying, I, this can't happen in my city. And I, you know, I don't, you know, I, I refuse to accept that this is happening. And on the other hand, I recognize that unless there's some type of disruption, you know, in, in what we want here in our country, things won't change. Just to simply knock on somebody's door and say, you know, I want equity and fairness, you know, without disruption, without anything behind it, it just doesn't work. I mean, we've been doing that for years since the 60s, you know, and the only reason Dr. King, the main reason Dr. King and those guys and those uh, freedom fighters back then, you know, got a lot of the things that they asked for is because news media started televising it. We started getting television and folks around the, around the country and around the world was seeing you know, the, the dogs getting you put on, on black folks and water hoses and getting beat, you know, and, and all doing this, you know, not fighting back. You know, since those, since those days, you know, and, and the lack of leadership in, in our black community that, that we need, I think we fall, we've fallen off, you know. And now when we ask for things, you know, we don't necessarily get what we need when we ask for fairness, when we ask for equity. You know, it hasn't been given to us. But now, since, you know, there's disruption and, you know, we've getting, gotten more people involved in, in our struggle and our fight that we've been dealing with for decades, you know, people are starting to listen. So on one hand, I'm like, this can't happen in my city. On the other hand, I'm like, I recognize the, the disruption that needs to happen for real change to occur. So what can I do as mayor to ensure that we have the change necessary as well and, and calm people's angers and frustration about the lack of progress that we've made, you know, over so many decades since the since the 60s. Mm -hmm. And we came up with a change initiative, which is community helping Aurora's necessary growth and empowerment. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything we're doing now is wrong. I've been mayor for the last three and a half years. I was an alderman for 10 years before that. We have put a lot of policies in place to ensure try to ensure equity and fairness, but there's so much more we can do. And that's what the change initiative is about, is taking that, taking it to the next level. Right now, the first phase is looking at, you know, our police's use of force, making sure that, you know, that we don't, you know, employ chokeholds or any type of, you know, holds or, or you know, the type of force that would take someone's life. We, we look for every way we possibly can. I mean, crime is going to happen. We're a large city, over 200,000 people. 
things happen. But we want to make sure when it does happen, we treat, you know, the folks that we uh, that are alleged to have committed these crimes with equity and fairness and allow them their day in court, not, you know, at some funeral home somewhere wondering whether or not they actually committed that crime. Mm -hmm. You know, so we started this looking at uh, uh, the force used as well as the police training. And this is just the first phase. We're, and it, we're focusing on the police only because, you know, the police are the main subject of everything going on throughout the country. But we want to take it in our second and third phases, any phases after that, to involve the whole city government and the whole city, and even regionally, to talk about what we need to do to ensure equity, fairness, and, and social justice. So our change initiative, you know, brought people off the streets rioting and into, you know, rooms to talk to each other about what we need to do to work together to make a difference in our community for all of us, you know, and, and we've got black, white, Latino, Indian, Asian people participating in this, making sure that we've got equity for, for African-Americans as well as everybody else in our community. But we all know, and everybody in those room knows that the, the, that with the focus now is African-Americans because we haven't been given that, that, that same, that same opportunity for, for fairness and equity, you know, for, for decades, for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And now Absolutely. I think we're all taking a look at it, taking a look Absolutely. at it. Absolutely. Because the thing is, is, as you both have articulated, is that you can have equity and fairness, which is one goal that we're trying to reach, but it also turns on access as well. Exactly. So there right. can be the existence of equity and fairness, but if we don't have the access to for people to even get it, uh, then that presents to be a, a further barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, just to transition into our questions and answers from those who are watching, uh, I'm going to uh, ask them as best I can, and then uh, we'll, we'll close uh, a little bit before one. Uh, so, uh, Mayor Irving, we don't have I feel like I'm in church. <laughs> Time is flying, brother. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I feel like I'm in church. We don't have a question. We have a comment okay. um, from Dr. Colzette Hoy. She says, congratulations on becoming the first black mayor of Aurora. Uh, she believed in you becoming an attorney and she's sending you goodwill and blessings. Uh, she was your former uh, Robert Morris classmate. Oh, wow. Uh, and so hey she there. Uh, little shout out to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey. We have a question from Ted. This is directed to uh, uh, Attorney Adams. Uh, and this, I, I think that this is uh, a long lasting, not just question, but mm -hmm. a discussion. He is speaking from his perspective as a white male Roosevelt alum. Uh, his question, what can I as a white male Roosevelt alum do to help promote criminal justice reform? Yeah, I mean, you, you got to have the discussion um, that that's where that's where it, it, it starts at is to have that discussion. We look, Mayor Irvin, um, Natasha and I, we can have the conversation amongst us and how it affects our community. Um, that's only going to help so much. If you look at the great movements in our country, they weren't done just by the people it was affected. It was the people who, who it didn't affect as well. And so you got to understand that that in this situation, in terms of criminal justice reform and the numbers that we have, silence is complicit. You're being, if you're being silent in a conversation like this, you're supporting the injustices that continue to go on in our country. Absolutely. You can have whatever view you want to have in terms of crime and punishment, but you can't ignore the fact that we right now are the greatest incarcerator in the world. Um, and, and, and we're talking about 2.3 million people incarcerated, um, and the number of, of the 2.3 million incarcerated is close to 750 to 800,000 black men. So we, we have to understand and say to ourselves that if nothing else, something is wrong with that number, right? These are the conversations that we have to have amongst all communities. I, I could go inside of, a, uh, of an affluent white community and have this conversation. Um, they may hear me, but they'll listen to their peers. That has to come from my, my, my alum who asked that question. And that, that's where you, um, and don't think that you aren't being effective by holding someone accountable at the water cooler, right? Because when you change opinions and you change views, you change behaviors. And that's really what we're dealing with as a result of the years of our horrible past and slavery. We're dealing with the narrative right now that has survived the chains and the beatings 
and, and in segregation. Right now, we're dealing with the narrative that has been beaten, beaten to us. And like Mayor Irvin said about the pictures, uh, 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 the, 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 the media coverage is what started to move the civil rights movement. Uh, but before then, the depiction of African Americans in general was barbaric in nature. It was, it was of this, all of these negative connotations came from um, somewhere else. Not everyone has had an experience with an African American. It has come from a lot of the depiction. And so what we have to do collectively is this. We cannot build on a shaky foundation. We have to acknowledge the past and repair it to the best of our ability in order to start building on it. If not, what we're doing is we're changing and putting beautiful looking faucets on a situation that we know deserves to have the floor ripped up and changing of the pipes. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. So no no window dressing justice. Right. Exactly right. You got to exactly get right. to the roots. Exactly got to right. get to the roots. Uh, thank you so much. Um, going back to the questions and the chat, uh, Mayor Irving, you are popular uh, because you have another shout out uh from a uh alum uh balsa class in 1999 professor tammy thurman she oh hey hello. <laughs> uh, Connie brown agrees with you uh both by saying you absolutely right we have to build a new narrative and show who and whose we are um let's see uh i'm trying to make sure to go to all of the questions uh we have a question uh, that says, why do you believe, this is for you both, why do you believe that it is so difficult to hold prosecutors responsible for Brady violations and other misconduct that lead to wrongful convictions, even when there's systematic misconduct like in New Orleans? So for the audience, Brady violations, and, and both our panelists can speak to this, Brady violations is um, when there are a selection of jurors, if I remember correctly. Um, no, it's, it's in terms of the evidence. So thank you, evidence, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, you know what I'm thinking about. I'm yeah, thinking about no. the the picking yeah. of people on jury, the jury. Yeah, jury, that, the jury that, selection. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you, Batson. 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 Yeah. Thank you. I know it started with the B. I'm like, I know I'm not crazy. <laughs> All right, so speak to uh, that question about Brady uh, violations. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it difficult to hold prosecutor, prosecutors responsible for that? Mayor? Well, you, you know, I, as a prosecutor for <laughs> a number of years, you know, I, I, I would say this, you know, a Brady violation, when you fail to give, you know, evidence, police reports or any type of evidence, you know, in a case that is, is due to the defense. And, uh, you know, prosecutors just oftentimes, you know, play, play stupid, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, they say, well, I didn't realize I didn't give this information. I didn't realize how important it was to the case that it could have potentially absolved this, this individual. You know, they have a certain immunity um, based on prosecuting, just like police officers, uh, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question, you know, because I, I know a number of cases, matter of fact, out in this area where prosecutors, you know, over the years, it, it hadn't happened recently, but in, in high profile cases, failed to give all the information and then somebody ended up going to prison sitting on death row for 10 years, you know, it, it, until, you know, DNA is run and they get the right information and realize the police and prosecutors have been sitting on this the whole time and decided on their own that this was invaluable information for the defense, you know. Yeah. Um, and in those particular instances, with those uh, police and prosecutors were prosecuted and, and all found to be not guilty. You know, um, and it's because they decided they just wanted to play stupid. I didn't, I had no idea this information was out there. I didn't know it was going to absolve this person of this particular murder. I, you know, it wasn't me that did it. So it, it, right. they, people always pass, people always pass the buck. Um, but I think as a society, you know, as a justice system, we have to hold people more responsible when things like this happen from the police and the situation. Um, with George Floyd, you know, holding them more responsible, he, that police officer, the onlookers, and then the prosecutors that, you know, may prosecute that case and not provide all the information to, to the defense attorneys. You know, we as a society have to start looking at our justice system and saying, we've got to hold people responsible, more responsible than we have in the past, which, you know, I think looking at the history, especially dealing with African Americans, they have not held the, these police and prosecutors responsible. I mean, the, the mayor is absolutely right. It's an individual thing. 
Um, yeah. you, can't, you can't see a Mayor Irvin doing that because why? Because he comes from that community, like, right? You, you know, so, and, and, and I'm dealing with a case like that right now. And, and you know, viewers can go check it out. It's, it's a Waverly, Virginia case where two innocent guys were, were convicted and I actually located the evidence that was withheld and there's still barriers to getting back into court. But what I, what I will say is this, here's what I'll say about, um, it's very concerning as a society where I can sue you civilly and get as much as information as I want to, including your grandmother's favorite color. But if I'm charged with a crime, there's a game to be had with discovery and whether or not I get it and whether I get it the day before trial. Right, that's, right, right, right. That's a problem and it needs to be fixed and it needs to be fixed fast. There's also this, there's this, 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 this pitting of the sides in our criminal justice system, right? That is unhealthy for justice. You have um, the prosecution side against the defense side and the loser oftentimes is justice because it could be a pencil popping contest or a penny pitching contest. People's competitive juices are gonna flow. It's natural human instincts. So people are gonna wanna win, right? And so when you have that, you have people just wanting to win. You don't have justice. You have people wanting to believe more in finality than they do about admitting that they made a mistake. And so there are a couple different things that are wrong. And what I, what I, need, what I believe needs to happen is this. I believe that there needs to be a separate entity, a separate body, and not a grand jury, because you can indict a ham sandwich or not. See Eric Gardner's case over in New York for right, the lack right. of that indictment. Absolutely. There needs to be a separate body of community people who are, are, are deciding whether or not it goes from the police to the prosecutor's office. Because it is, it is you have the prosecution's office working with the police department. There is no closer relationship other than doctor, nurse, right? So it's difficult sometimes for prosecutors to call out someone that they know they're going to have to call back on the stand for another case down the exactly line. Exactly right. Exactly. So right. we need to remove those difficulties, right? Don't ask a person to be in those uncomfortable situations and create a body that is strictly designed to not see color. You, they should be able to see names on a paper, accusations, and be able to decide whether or not there's enough evidence for it to be prosecuted and in terms of what the charges may be. Because if not, you have that ugly D word, discretion, that is used by the person who can see themselves cutting breaks to the people that looks like them, but not to the folks who don't look like them. So there are some things that, that I haven't all the way flushed out, but I'll say this. I would rather try new things than keep up what we're doing right now, because 2.3 million people says it's not working. It ain't mm -hmm. working. It's mm -hmm. not working. So I have the task, first of all, thank, thank, <laughs> First of all, thank our panelists, uh, but also thank you to our community, to our audience who has been uh, participating. There is one question that I would like to ask, and Maybelline, I would ask for just a little bit of grace to try and sum up these 13 comments into uh, a, a parting question. Uh, there are comments that talk about uh, what are the takeaways? What are the tangible action items that we can do now to try to affect change, to try to create uh, criminal justice reform? Uh, is it, do we start with the young people with mentoring programs? Do we start in higher education? Do we start in government? Do we start with police? So what, to, to close, uh, Mayor Irving and Attorney Adams, what would you suggest for laypersons what do you suggest that we do to be able to try and address not just the problem, but to create uh, the solution? I'll, no. I'll let the go mayor ahead. close you out. Know, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, go ahead, go ahead, brother, go ahead. I, I want the mayor to close out. Um, so I'll just say this, all of the above, you know, everyone in their particular area, you, you, you can't overwhelm yourself 
with something as big as overhaul of a system or a narrative that have been going on for hundreds of years. So what I would say is this, in your individual capacities and areas in which you are in, whether that be a school teacher, right? Start to have the conversations early about the true history of our country and about uh, policing and encouraging kids at a very early age to get involved in the law. I'm not sure if Mayor, Mayor Irvin, Irvin can share the same sentiment, but I don't remember seeing a Mayor Irvin or Jared Adams come in my school <laughs> when I was in fifth, sixth grade and tell me I could be a lawyer. Here's how you can do it. I could be a politician. I can do this. I didn't see that. And so what we need to do is this. Right now in the city of Chicago and a lot of other cities, including the city of Aurora, if we don't get to our babies by sixth grade, it's too late. So we have to find a way to become better mentors and also teaching our kids the unfiltered truth about our past and education in order to, to make this thing better. I don't want people to walk away thinking all doom and gloom, because let me tell you something. Mayor Irvin, myself, and Natasha wouldn't be leading this discussion if we were still 50, 60, 70 years ago. It true. would be difficult to do. So I think right. we should be proud as a nation at how far we've come, but there's no time now to drop the baton that was given to us by people like John Lewis, who recently passed away. I thank you guys again for having me on. That's, you know, that's good trouble and a good transition. Mayor Irvin. And, and I'll close up and say I agree with everything you just said. I, I think dealing with crime in the community and just social justice is a multi-pronged approach. You know, you can't just rely on the police to have all the answers. You know, you can't just rely on, you know, government to have all the answers or the community. All these things have to work together. You know, and as part of the community approach and, and, and this multi-pronged approach to making you know, your, your neighborhood safer, you know, you have to focus on young people. I make it a point now, unfortunately, during COVID, I haven't been able to do it, you know, as, as much as I'd like or at all, really, because the schools are closed. But I make it a point, as you pointed out, there, when, I was, when I was growing up in grade school, we didn't have lawyers, especially black lawyers coming in saying you could be a black lawyer one day or you could be the mayor one day, or you know you could be even successful in more than your circumstances. So I make it a point to go to, to schools where kids can see me that look just like me and say, you know, if, and I tell them, if I can do it, I'm no smarter, I'm no better. I sat in the same desks, I live in the same neighborhoods. If I can become successful, so can you. And I ask kids, what do you wanna be? And I tell them, I believe in you, you can be that. So we've got to focus on, on making sure that our, our young people believe in themselves. Like I didn't believe in myself for, for so long until somebody at Robert Morris believed in me, then I began to. I want to believe in themselves at a very young age. Third grade is, is the age where, you know, if we don't get, you know, in a kid's mind and tell them that he can believe in himself, that we start to lose them. Third grade. So we want to make sure that we get our, that we get our young people excited about who they are, about their future, about the possibility of their future, you know, and impress upon them that they could do anything that they want to do. And if we if we do that as part as as part as this multi prong approach, if we focus on on our young people and our kids and giving them opportunities, I'm telling you, we will be a better country, we'll be a better community in, in, in the future. We will be. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Maybelline, and I'm just going to wrap up by saying uh, the woman is theologian um, whose name we speak. Her name is Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon. She said that we all are to do the work our soul must have. And so to be able to continue this conversation, just do the work that makes sense to your soul. Uh, if it's talking with a politician, if it's talking to young people, if it's talking to police or going to your alderman or alderwoman meetings, whatever it is, start where you are because that platform is the most engaging and is the most influential because it involves you. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Maybelline. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Irvin, sure. Mr. Adams, Professor, Ro Professor Robinson for your expertise and truly insightful discussion today. And, and thank you to our huge audience who joined us. I do want to share that Roosevelt recently started the Black Student Equity Fund that supports the success of Black students and promotes equity in higher education attainment through scholarship programming and campus events. And if you're interested in making a contribution, please visit uh, the web page that I think Christy is putting in the chat box. You can also find it on roosevelt.edu. Thank you again and have a wonderful, wonderful day.
Thank well, one you more for thing. having me on. You guys have a great day. Can we have a, a shout out for Attorney Adams, who is going to be, I, I think you are publishing a book, Justice for Sale. Uh, yeah. if you could make sure that we support our, our fellow alum. I'm sure that uh, Christy or myself, we could put that information in the chat as well. Thank you. Absolutely. It's available for pre-order now, and I thank you again. Congratulations, thank brother. You. Thank you all. Well, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good being on with you.